Easy Rider is a 1969 movie following two bikers as they make their way to Mardi Gras with the money they've made from smuggling drugs. Along the way, they meet other people living similar carefree lifestyles, some of which join them on their journey, as well as some people who hate them and think people like them are ruining the country. While I'm not sure I got as much out of the movie as was there for me to get, I thought this was an interesting look at this time period, and some of the ways people were trying to react to the dominant culture versus preserve it. There's not really anybody to root for in this film, per se, as all the characters are either unlikable or keep the audience at arm's length. But the questions it raises about conforming to society versus breaking away are very interesting to consider in light of the story. It's a film I'm glad to have seen, but not necessarily one that I feel an urge to watch again. A long of the scenes are long and winding, and I'm not sure I'd get any more from them a second time, but I get why people really love and connect to this film. I'm just not one of those people. Encanto is the newest Disney release about a magical family in a remote village in Colombia. We mostly focus on one daughter, Mirabel, the only one in her family to not be gifted a magical superpower. But now she's also the only one who is starting to notice that the magic they've relied on for decades might be fading. This is the third musical released this year, featuring music by Lin-Manuel Miranda, so it's no surprise that the soundtrack is really fantastic. It does just such an excellent job of creating the world through song. But the story is lovely too, with a rich cast of characters, many of whom get their own song and distinct story arc, and a beautiful message about family and acceptance. The magical realism of the story brings with it levels of metaphor that will fly over kids' heads, but had me thinking about them for days. It's one of those special kids movies where it's easily entertaining enough for children, but it also goes a little bit deeper to provide a great story for adults too. Everybody's Talking About Jamie is a filmed version of a recent stage musical. It's about a teenage boy who decides he wants to be a drag queen and has to figure out how he can be authentically himself in a school that doesn't seem too eager to accept him. This musical took the West End by storm and became something of a cult classic, especially among young musical theater lovers. And I get why. It is deeply heartwarming to see Jamie working to find himself, especially when it is well received. And the story does a good job of placing him in the context of LGBTQ plus history. We see where his journey is easier than those who came before him, as well as how it is still a challenge in many ways. The songs in this don't immediately jump out to me as classics, but maybe they just need some more listening? They're certainly performed well by this solid cast. I also like how the film leans into the theatricality of the musical numbers, using them to really convey a feeling more than just deliver expository information. I'm not totally sold on this for myself, but I'm glad to have seen it. And I'm sure there are a lot of people for which this musical will deeply matter to them, and that's really great. The Little Rascals is a 1994 adaptation of the classic series about a group of small boys who have solemnly sworn off women and get into hijinks around their town. In this particular version of the story, the boys are trying to win the go-kart derby, but their chosen racer Alfalfa is falling in love, and so his friends decide to sabotage his new relationship to try to get him focused back on club business. So there's a specific kind of humor centered around watching small children speak like adults. And while I do love seeing how kids naturally pick up adult speech patterns in the process of learning language, I find it not at all entertaining when those lines are scripted by adults to be funny. And that's 90% of this humor, watching kids repeat lines grown-ups obviously wrote for them. And it just doesn't work for me on any level. It doesn't feel natural, and I have no attachment to these characters, so not even that can win me over. I fully believe there are people this movie is for, it's not trying to be anything other than what it is, but it's certainly not for me. Renaissance Man stars Danny DeVito as an ad executive who loses his job and ends up getting an unusual gig teaching in a military academy. He's given a particular group of undereducated recruits and asked to teach them basic comprehension of the English language to raise their competency as soldiers. As they make their way through Shakespeare's Hamlet together, he gets to know them better and tries to figure out how he can support them in their career. So let's be honest, I'm never not going to have a fondness for a movie about how theater can change students' lives. No matter how sappy the movie gets at times, and it does, I love watching people fall in love with plays, whether on screen or in the real life work I do in my own theater teaching. It does, of course, hit all the tropes of the classic teacher movie and doesn't really expand on or bring much new to the genre, but it handles those tropes competently, and I was happy to go along on the journey. There's more character drama here than there is comedy, so if you're expecting to laugh out loud, you'll be disappointed. But I found it a pretty adequately sweet watch. Spencer is a biopic looking at a few days in the life of Princess Diana as she spends Christmas with the royal family. Diana just wants to have a quiet holiday with her boys and is tired and frustrated with her loveless marriage and all the things forbidden to her because of her position, from opening presents on Christmas Day instead of Christmas Eve to keeping her curtains open. 
The film does an incredible job of showing the stifling atmosphere of this formal holiday gathering and making us feel how Diana is truly at the very edge of her sanity, completely trapped and held back from anything she tries to do to ground herself. Kristen Stewart is stunning here, every moment charged with barely contained, and sometimes not at all contained, fury at the situation she's in. And as she makes impulsive, unpredictable choices to try to regain some agency, it's impossible not to sympathize with her. The cinematography and soundtrack contribute beautifully to the film's suffocating mood as well. Overall, a powerful and compelling glimpse into one person's specific life. The Group is a Sydney Lumet film about eight women who are all in the same graduating class in college. The film follows their lives after graduation, their marriages, their job prospects, their political activism, and the relationships they still keep with each other as part of the same group of college friends. The movie moves along very quickly, in the kind of way that makes sense when you're basically marking time between big events. While it's really interesting to dip in and out of each woman's life, there are so many of them, and so many of them look similar to each other, that I could really only keep track of about half of them. This is the kind of thing that I would love to see remade in the current day, as well as one of those ensemble casts that would benefit from star casting because it would be easier to track who is who. Because this is such an episodic film, much of the narrative doesn't actually emotionally land until the very end. Up until then, everything that happens just feels like another small piece of the puzzle and feels a little inconsequential. But it's still a very interesting movie, and something very different than Lumet ever did again. So I'm really glad I got to see it, and I definitely suggest watching it. The Mirror is a dreamlike, non-linear memory film, featuring pieces of a young man's life as a boy and as an adult, living through a war, raising a child, and more. It's directed by Andrei Tarkovsky of Stalker and Solaris fame, and just to be honest, I could not stand either of those movies. Tarkovsky's directing moves at a snail's pace, and his dialogue is nearly always philosophical ponderings more than anything directly related to the characters, which makes it even harder for me to connect to. His style is certainly distinct, and I understand and respect that people like him, but I feel too often that I'd get the exact same effect from reading a philosophy book while occasionally glancing at a photo of the countryside. <laughs> I keep hoping that one of these days I'll find the Tarkovsky film that clicks for me the way that he does for others, but this one, with its memory play feeling and jumping all over the timeline, is not that one. It is shorter than most of his others, which made it an easier watch for me, so it might be a good entry point into Tarkovsky for newbies, and if you like this one, he's definitely got more that are in similar veins. The Last Duel tells the story of two friends in medieval France, one a knight and one a squire, who ultimately grow apart and end up challenging each other to a duel when one's wife accuses the other of rape. The film's gimmick is that it's told three times, Rashomon style, following each man and then the wife's version of the story. However, unlike Rashomon, the three different tellings don't really add to the story as much as they just rehash what we already know. The film does add some subtle differences in the interpretation of the events between each person, but most of those differences weren't interesting or unique enough to make me interested in watching the same story basically three times in a row. I like all the performances in this, however. Between this and Stillwater, Matt Damon is really leaning into the character of ignorant wannabe hero in 2021. I think I would have enjoyed this a bit more if it had cut back and forth between the three perspectives throughout, instead of playing them one after another. Because while the movie is fine, it's, again, not good enough for me to want to watch it three times in a row, and that's basically what I felt like I did.